So, recently, I saw the live-action Ghost in the Shell movie, and, of course, like the shitstorm it stirred from accusations of whitewashing to bastardizing the original 1995 anime film, naturally, I have some thoughts on it as well. Hopefully, I'm not too late to the party, but I just wanted to have some time to gather my thoughts properly. If you couldn't tell by now, Ghost in the Shell is one of my favorite anime of all time. It's a mix of the intellectual depth found in art house films combined with the blockbuster action that really had a profound impact on me, and later, my love for the cyberpunk subgenre. I don't want to talk about the movie itself for too long, mostly because I could probably fill a whole 20 minute video on it exclusively, but not giving a quick overview would be a bit unfair, so here are my thoughts in summary. As I thought it would be, it's a half-decent-ish sci-fi film, but not having much of that Ghost in the Shell vibe. It met my expectations squarely, though that's not a compliment, as my predictions for it were rather low. On the good side, the casting of Beat Takashi as Aramaki made for some of the best scenes in the film, and as much as I am partial to the vocal performances of both Osamu Saka and William Knight in the role, Takashi's take on it was a pleasure to see. Now, my major... <laughs> Complaints with the film would be the reliance on Tell Don't Show, when historically, Ghost in the Shell is a franchise that loves to leave things ambiguous and open to interpretation. Thank you, Mamoru Oshii. The times when this film liked to shoehorn in almost shot-for-shot -shot recreations felt forced, as the context behind these situations made little logical sense sometimes. And while I appreciated parts of the major story arc, I didn't particularly like how she was portrayed as a character, though as of yet I am not willing to lay blame for that solely at ScarJo's feet, as the material she was given wasn't the best to begin with. A big part of the film was that the Major emoted more. She was prone to anger at times, and I'm sure fans of previous iterations like myself would slightly feel alienated as a result. This is more from the influence of the manga in Arise, where she felt more human at times than Cyborg. The cast took a step back and instead placed focus more on Bato and the Major, which could go both ways for some people. Fans of Togusa, Saito, and the gang of Section 9, you'll be disappointed as they are little more than mouthpieces to carry the narrative. Of course, it's impossible to mention Ghost in the Shell without touching upon the jaw-dropping set pieces. Hollywood budget aside, this was no different to other entries in the universe. Great attention to detail, though I would have personally preferred it if they went the Blade Runner route for the sweeping city landscapes to, you know, make everything feel a bit more real rather than the CG-produced metropolis that we got. A point of concern before the movie was released was its PG-13 rating compared to the mature rating for the anime. While I would have loved for it to have been rated R to really push its artistic limits and not be tied down by the family-friendly shackles of Hollywood, it's understandable why they went for a safer PG-13. Having the movie for ages 17 plus is a huge risk for any company, and with a whopping budget of 100 plus million with an IP that is at best in cult status, that would even more restrict its already limited scope. Hollywood as it is is extending their neck out even more by restricting their demographic reach, and using examples like Deadpool and Logan for their popular popularity aren't valid comparisons in my opinion since those titles are already loved by mainstream crowds that have had years to accumulate a multi-generational fanbase with a lesser budget so the risk in these cases would be minimal. With the teaser clip shown throughout its promotional campaign, the staff interviews, and the exclusive behind-the-scenes footage, you can clearly tell that the team was passionate about the project. They felt the pressure of not only living up to the expectations of fans of the anime and manga, but also to attract a new audience who will enjoy their interpretation. Capturing that sense of wonder is a win for any filmmaker, and you could tell that was their source of inspiration when they first laid their eyes on the 1995 anime film like many of us did. However, I feel it's important to highlight that Rupert Sanders is not a writer. Criticize his work all you want, but he knows how to make a production look good. All that's missing on his arsenal is a good writer on board, which unfortunately is what most people will judge in a film, which leads to the writing. I believe there is a solid concept beneath this Hollywood mask, but the script quality suffered because they seemed to be trying to cram multiple interpretations and ideas all at once. Kenji Kamiyama's standalone complex and second gig, Mamoru Oshii's original and Innocence film, and even a little bit of a rise in there. And while I can understand that this would have been an attempt to mitigate fans of the original, the problem is they're taking several universes that all differ from one another, including the new live action bits, and trying to make some coherent story out of it. Now, I don't know about you, but that's quite an expansive universe to cover in just one movie. What are you suggesting, Hollywood? 
But this is huge for the anime industry because whether you like it or not, the popularity of the medium is only growing from here. Sure, there's going to be a looming corporate entity that's going to hover over the hobby we know and love and it's only natural to be defensive about it since we're seeing the inklings of it happening right now. The reason Crunchyroll, Funimation, Sentai, Discotech, all these companies came this far was because they keep their pulse with the fandom. At the moment, anime has yet to really reach mainstream status with a tightly knit network of fans and has yet to achieve that callous status normally associated from mainstream TV and film. This is because for the most part licensing companies in the West are very much run by fans for fans. However, with anime strike from Amazon and Anchor Bay as well as Netflix, there are companies that carry this corporate baggage and they do not seem interested in getting in touch with their viewership. Crunchyroll recently hit their 1 million paid subscriber milestone, and their next goal is to reach fans outside of their organic reach. Large companies are the ideal candidates in broadening that scope, but the way those bigger establishments go about in converting budding fans is, let's say, is counterintuitive and laughable at times. We're looking at you, Netflix and Little Witch Academia. But the key difference is that these companies, unlike Crunchyroll, have the ability to convert watchers on a large scale than the others could ever imagine with the piles of money they can throw around. Which brings me back to the live-action Ghost in the Shell film. Yes, there is an inherent layer of Hollywood watering down the original content. Yes, maybe Scarlett Johansson might not have been the ideal candidate for the film, but this is a step in the right direction for Hollywood in my opinion. These guys aren't going away anytime soon and seem to have noticed the growing market and have an interest on investing this venture further. As much as some of us would prefer that Hollywood just left anime adaptations alone and never bothered with them, they are going to continue adapting them regardless. So we can hope that things will just get better from here. It's certainly understandable the appeal of anime becoming mainstream, the possibility of openly discussing the medium in a public space in the same degree as comic books or other widely accepted geekdom, it's a tantalizing thought. However, there is the predatory corporate identity that could threaten to trespass on the tight-knit camaraderie anime fans have enjoyed for decades. The quirkiness, the long 90-second openings and ending credits that we sing and dance to, the token juvenile hanging out on the school roof, the 20-minute internal monologues, and not to forget the trend of freakishly long light novel names, these tropes that we have all come to know, love, and associate with anime are things that could be compromised or even disappear in order to reach a wider audience. Basically, the identity of the anime fan that we have enjoyed for years could drastically change. But if you take into consideration the fact that few anime adaptations that come to mind are, I don't know, Dragon Ball Evolution, think about the overall quality between that and Ghost in the Shell. Change occurs in baby steps, and if this film has to take one for the team towards the pathway of creating a great Hollywood anime adaptation someday, I think we can handle a couple of blunders. In the end, Ghost in the Shell 2017 was not the film I had hoped it would be. It was largely a wonderfully decorated shell with the ghost not fully manifested within, but it's definitely present, flickering ever so slightly inside the dark. But in the end, that's just my opinion. What do you guys think? Do you think this will be the death knell of the niche corner of the anime fandom that we've carved out? Let me know down in the comments below. And a thank you to my patrons, and a very special thanks to Joshua Garcia, Calhoun Boy, Victor Ekmark, Siri Amico, and Bing Theo for being supremely awesome. And until next time, ladies, gentlemen, and others, stay frosty.